So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Environmental Science and Peace, new high school lessons and tools that will help us integrate sustainability and peace building. Um, I'm delighted to open the session tonight, this one hour webinar. My name is Patricia Schaefer. I am executive director of the nonprofit New Gen Peace Builders. I'm also senior fellow for peace building at the, or peace education at the Alliance for Peace Building. Um, some of you on the line may be familiar with both organizations, but for those of you who are not, uh, New Gen Peace Builders is a nonprofit that has been delivering peace education training and mentoring, both in the United States and outside of the United States for eight years now. The Alliance for Peace Building is based in Washington, DC and is a member-based organization with approximately 110 organizations that are members, as well as 15,000 professionals who are focused on conflict resolution and peace building. Uh, tonight in this one hour session, you're going to hear uh, several voices. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to who our presenters are tonight. Uh, but first, I just want to say that we're delighted to have you with us for the next hour. And um, our intention is that by the time we leave the session, uh, we have done a good job of perhaps providing you with a service to share, share some new ideas and tools that could be available to you who are educators and students in your classrooms. Um, but hopefully there will be something in our Q&A tonight and in the presentations where you feel you've personally benefited too. Um, our intention is to work as a team and really give you sort of the parts and pieces of a story that adds up to helping us all understand how you can actually integrate the notions of environmental science and peace. And I do want to say something particular about that. Um, often when uh, the term peace education or peace building or peace, uh, the terms are used, uh, we assume that that's a standalone activity that we have to work on of and by itself. Uh, we happen to have a belief at New Gen Peace Builders, and I think my colleagues and partners from the other organizations you'll hear from tonight believe that too. And to really be effective in peace education or peace and peace building, you have to do a good job equipping uh, all kinds of people with tools and insights and data and understanding that helps them be peace builders, whatever realm of life or profession or path they have chosen. So that's our intention tonight, to really see and um, make the case for the intersection of the two and to present to you some brand new tools that can help you, especially you as educators who are on the line tonight. Could I get a little help from my tech team moving forward, please? Thanks. Um, so we do assume that most of the people on the, um, uh, on the Zoom tonight in the session are educators, because for tonight, we've been intentionally reaching out to, first and foremost, high school educators who are in um, advanced placement environmental sciences as an instructional field, or environmental science in general, or some of the educators on the line are in STEM and not necessarily environmental science per se. Um, but before we really go any further, we want to thank you. We want to thank you as educators. Uh, we want to thank you for um, all of the steps that you're taking in these very challenging and fluid times to, con to continue educating um, young people so that they can continue their classwork and continue their learning process and journey. Um, it is a very, very uh, challenging period that we're in. We know that for sure. Um, we want to thank you because one of the things that we believe is when the United Nations created the notion of the moniker, the phraseology of culture of peace, one of the things that they intended was that we understand that creating a culture of peace really means changing the minds or mindsets. And changing the minds, when they introduced this idea of culture of peace, was an indication that first and foremost, they believed education was at the heart of shaping and changing minds. So we appreciate you for the work that you do and we hope these tools tonight will add to that. Um, we are in the business of changing minds because if we want a planet where peace is the norm, where there is a culture of peace, then we work from the premise that we must start with young people. There are 3 billion people on the planet who are under the age of 30. There are 1.8 billion people who are between the ages of 15 and 24. It's the fastest growing demographic on the planet. And we honestly believe that in the United States in particular, uh, young people have an incredibly influential role to play in sharing their voices and thoughts about what our future can hold. Uh, this Saturday, we'll be hosting a five hour webinar that's a global webinar. We have nearly 400 young people attending who are going to be sharing ideas and tips and tools and their own experiences with peace building. And it's such a formative period 
um, that it's really up to us to indicate that young people between the ages of 15 and 24 should really be at the center of peace building. And tonight we really mean uh, be at the center of learning about the intersection between environmental science and peace building. Oops, friends, sorry. Um, so the spirit of this evening is really about what we call making learning to be a peace builder a rite of passage for everyone. And uh, this group that you see in front of you is actually um, an image of 210 young peace builders who came together in Houston in February 2019 for an accelerator summit on peace building. In the course of that accelerator summit, these young people, over 200 of them, identified the five issues that they care the most about and they think are at the heart of peace building. Interestingly enough, hunger was there, homelessness, gun violence, intolerance, but so was the environment. In fact, one of the things that we're finding over and over again in research and our conversations with young people in Nugent Peace Builders is that the two top issues or areas of interest for them are, when you say peace building, one, increasingly the environment and sustainability, and two, human rights. And increasingly, these young people see a natural intersection between the two. If you consider human rights, creating conditions of well-being for all. So we know that environmental science is one of the fastest growing uh, study areas at the high school level in the United States, and the demand and interest in peace building is too. So as we can see from these young people in Houston, when you bring the two together, it's a really powerful combination. Um, some years ago, former President John F. Kennedy said that peace is a process and a way of solving problems. And it's really the challenge of each new generation. So tonight we're gonna talk about peace as a process and a way of solving problems and a challenge of the current generation that's interested in environmental sustainability. So uh, you'll hear very briefly from me. Uh, my job is to open the session and I'll have some uh, closing comments and next steps for everybody who's joining us. But we also have three other uh, speakers who are really central to the webinar tonight. One is Tucker Stillman. He is a senior at South Mecklenburg High School in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, we're really featuring Tucker because you're going to hear that many of the tools that we're going to talk about tonight that are now going to be available to you were actually developed with active involvement of a master educator in, who teaches environmental science, including advanced placement environmental um, sustainability. Um, and more than 12 interns who spent the summer with us who are all trained new gen peace builders, some of whom who have taken environmental science classes at the high school level, and uh, some have not. And it was a great learning journey for all of them, but they worked with this master educator and our team to really shape these tools in ways that seem very relevant to educators in high schools and very relevant to the students they serve. So you're going to hear from Tucker and he's gonna give you a little more detail on the curriculum that's been created to come alongside environmental science uh, curricula and specifically the advanced placement environmental science curricula and a particular unit on land and water use. You'll also hear from Michael Collins who, uh, he's gonna talk to you about something that got a lot of attention in the last few days. On September 9th, the organization for which he's the executive director in the Americas introduced its first eco ecological threat register. And it was um, such a sensation in terms of the attention and interest that it generated in media outlets around the world that uh, it's estimated that 2.5 billion people heard or saw some of the findings from the Ecological Threat Register. And so he's gonna give you um, a peek inside the register, an overview of it, and we've given him uh, some real space to do that so that you'll be up to speed on the register and you'll also be able to understand and appreciate why we would choose to work the Ecological Threat Register into the materials that we're making available to educators. You'll also hear from Dakota Stormer. Dakota Stormer is and has worked in the Shell uh, Sustainability Group he is the founder and CEO of Footprint App, and you'll be introduced to um, the opportunity and flexibility that the Footprint App and Footprint uh, Carbon, uh, Carbon Footprint Calculator will give to you and students in your classrooms if you choose to receive these materials from us. 
Uh, also, Dakota is a United Nations Sustainable Development Goals facilitator. So he is really an expert on the topics that he's going to talk to you about. So putting that all together, we hope to take you on a journey that will help you understand the connections between environmental science, peace building, and a set of tools, including uh, curricula, the ecological threat register, and some tools uh, from Footprint that can be of service to you in your classrooms. Now, before I pass um, the presentation over to Tucker to talk about the curricular materials, um, I wanna say you might be asking, so what's the catch? Um, and there isn't one. Anybody who's on this webinar tonight and who uh, wants to avail themselves of these materials and join in a three-hour PD uh, in early October will have access to all these materials. And we, as three organizations, are delighted to provide them to you because we really think that this intersection between environmental peace, uh, sustainability, and peace building in the future is an incredible path and track to help young people be on. So Tucker, would you like to share more about the curricular materials that have been developed? Yes, thank you, Patricia. So as Patricia mentioned, I'm a high school student and I put an influential role in creating the curriculum that you're about to learn more about. So over the course of four months, a group of 12 interns, high school students from across the nation, met virtually working with an AP environmental science teacher who guided us to research, gather collections of articles that relate between the connection between environmental science and peace building, a connection that had not previously been made, and of course, develop the lessons that you're about to learn more about. So here's what we have. The environmental science and peace curriculum has five unique program elements. If I can get a little help from my tech team. So first and foremost, there's the easy access professional development and support. We have a three hour virtual PD supplemented with on-demand virtual coaching to support teachers use of the lessons and tools. There are three professional development sessions. Teachers are only required to attend one and you can sign up at the link below on the right. However, you'll have an opportunity later. Second, so the curriculum is designed for unit five, which is the land and water use of the AP environmental science course. We developed nine lessons for the nine specific subunits you see on the right. There are 17 total lessons. However, we identify that these nine are influential in create, making the greater connection that there is between environmental science and peace building. The curricular materials incorporate discussions, activities, and reflection questions aligned to environmental science courses and program standards. Third, we incorporate case studies of young peace builders. These inspirational videos example, examples illustrate design thinking and step-by-step -step approaches to team environmental peace projects. They're designed by high school students and serve as inspiration. The ETR developed by the Institute for Economics and Peace covers eight areas of ecological threats. Data sets, surveys, and indices compare country level measures of violence and peace with patterns of water-related stress, stresses, extreme weather, natural disasters, food security, poverty, and pandemics. Finally, the inclusion of the Footprint app and instructional materials enables students to measure and take steps to reduce individual and school carbon footprints through a 30-day challenge. Teachers who share results of their studies with Footprint App Incorporated are considered for awards and recognition and become a, a part of an overall port shared with schools for the climate action. I, as a high school student who's taken environmental science courses and a peace builder, am very excited at the prospect of other high school students getting to engage with this and make greater connection to environmental science and peace building. And my biggest takeaway for you as educators is that this isn't just another set of lessons for teachers or for students to breeze through and throughout. This is something that'll challenge their thinking and inspire them, to make a greater connection. And now Michael Collins will share with you the highlights of the new released Ecological Threat Register. Excellent, thank you very much, uh, Tucker. And uh, click to start remote control. I believe here I have control of the uh, screen. Uh, I will actually need it because I'm gonna be cycling through it. There we are, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. So very briefly with regards to the Institute, uh, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan research uh, institution dedicated to shifting the world's um, focus to peace as a positive, tangible and achievable measure of human well-being and progress. And we do that preliminarily, um, primarily through quantitative analysis. So uh, we develop a variety of reports, including uh, the Global Peace Index, the Positive Peace Index, the Global Terrorism Index, 
and a variety of other kind of sort of more country level reports, such as the Mexico Peace Index, which we do on an annual basis, and even a US Peace Index that we did back in 2012. So uh, all of these reports are used uh, extensively by multilateral organizations and, and governments around the world. Um, they're also included um, or referenced in a variety of university courses um, and are downloaded very frequently and, and consulted online as well. This is somewhat of a promotional slide, but the key point that I sort of wanted to make here is that as an organization, we do take our research extremely seriously, uh, understanding that the, the use of, uh, of, of our research uh, requires high levels of trust. So my main objective here today is to kind of sort of make you feel as comfortable as I can using um, uh, IEP's research material um, in your courses and with your students. So the Ecological Threat Register, uh, essentially what it does is it compares countries' exposure to the ecological threats with their underlying levels of resilience. Uh, so the objective of the work is to essentially identify those countries that are most vulnerable to ecological threats, um, but then more broadly, it also sort of aims to act as a catalyst uh, for resilience building activities worldwide. This is the inaugural edition of the Ecological Threat Register. It covers 157 countries, that's 97% uh, of the world's population. Um, and it essentially covers eight areas. It uses eight different indicators under two different domains. So the first domain is related to resource scarcity. That includes food security, water stress, and uh, population growth. The second domain relates to the impact from natural disasters, and that would include droughts, floods, cyclones, um, sea level rise, and temperature rise. Now, the Ecological Threat Register actually projects those threats out to 2050, so providing a snapshot of um, upcoming ecological threats over the next 30 years. It's developed by the methodology sort of bringing all of this, this together and making the different indicators globally comparable is developed by IEP. Um, but we do use uh, well-renowned um, uh, data sources for this, which you can consult in the report. Um, and the measure of resilience that I was mentioning very briefly before uses IEP's positive peace framework. So because we're gonna be touching on, on positive peace, Positive peace refers um, essentially to the underlying attitudes, institutions, and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. So um, IEP has developed these or, or, or found them empirically, essentially, by comparing countries' level of peacefulness, according to the Global Peace Index, a report that we developed, and then cross-referencing that with thousands of measures of socioeconomic progress to see what are the particular underlying things um, that then create changes in a country's level uh, of peacefulness over time, either negatively or positively. And by taking those, the ones that align more closely, we're able to develop a framework that enables us to be able to track a country's um, level of positive peace, its score, and improvements or deteriorations over time. Now, um, one of the important factors here is that countries with high levels of positive peace are also the countries that are most resilient to all forms of crisis, uh, including COVID-19, for example, um, or large-scale ecological events. So, um, you know, talking about sort of the elephant in the room and, and the, the large-scale uh, ecological events, we don't need to stray very far, of course. Uh, we have the West Coast uh, catching fire right now. We have essentially a record-setting hurricane season upon us. There's a recent impact. Um, from the derecho storms as well. Um, now, based on the register, the US is particularly susceptible to, to floods, uh, to cyclones, and also has relatively high levels of water stress as well. Now, on the plus side, the US also has relatively high levels of positive peace, which means that it, as a country, it's more capable of being able to respond and adapt to this changing situation. Um, but it should also be noted that the levels of positive peace that the US has have been deteriorating over the last decade, making it more difficult for us as a country to be able to deal with these impacts. And also just to highlight that independently of ultimately how um, well we're able to deal with our own climate crisis or our own future ecological threats, we are by no means immune, neither are other fully developed or even high peaceful countries, to the impacts of ecological threats in other countries as well. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is share some key findings from the register this year. 141 countries um, are exposed to at least one ecological threat between now 
and 2050. 16 countries aren't, aren't uh, exposed to those. Those are actually high peace countries for the most part. So countries like New Zealand, Costa Rica, Denmark. And I really want to highlight something that Tucker brought up very briefly, and that is we see through the data a very, very distinct relation, correlation, causality um, between ecological threats, number of ecological threats, and levels of peacefulness. Um, so there is a very strong nexus there, which I think we all intuitively feel, but um, the data very much supports. Now, 19 of the countries with the most threats, so that's four or more, according to the indicators we use, are home to essentially more than a quarter of the world's population right now. 10 of these are in the, the 40 least peaceful countries on the global peace index. 6.4 billion people live in countries uh, that are exposed to medium to high ecological threats, so more than two. And then <clears throat> generally, when comparing the number of ecological threats to the underlying level of resilience of a society, which we'll go into a tiny bit more uh, detail afterwards, we see three clusters of what we call ecological hotspots. These are countries that are susceptible to collapse in the near future. Um, and uh, Sorry, uh, regions um, and countries susceptible to collapse. So the first one is the Sahel Born, uh, the Sahel Belt of, of Africa from Mauritania to Somalia. So that includes uh, Chad, Sudan, Burkina Faso, uh, Mali, Niger, uh, the Southern African Belt from Angola to Madagascar, um, and then the Middle East and Central Asian Belt from Syria to Pakistan, so Iran, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. Now, <clears throat> one of the, um, let me just back up very slightly here, actually, I don't, I don't need to. One of the, using all of these calculations and the projections, we generally estimate um, that by 2050, we will be seeing 1.2 billion people will have been displaced by that time. Um, so this is a mud map um, about the number of ecological threats. Uh, this is actually available in kind of sort of interactive format on our, our website that you can visit. And students can actually cl click on individual countries to see what country, uh, what um, each country, uh, what ecological threats the country is most subject to. So they can do comparisons between different countries and of course they can consult the report for more detailed information on each. Um, I'd also like to note very quickly that this map here that you see doesn't include um, levels of resilience. We're gonna see that, that, um, that a bit further on. Um, and also that just the, the total number of ecological threats is not representative of the overall severity because obviously the, the intensity of any individual threat is incredibly important as well. Excellent. Now this is a, um, a, one of the sort of the example graphs that you can see inside the report. This is essentially a more detailed breakdown of what you saw before. Uh, these are the 19 countries most exposed to ecological threats, which as we said before, are among the world's 40 least peaceful countries. Uh, 10 out of these, in 10 out of these countries, the population is going to expand by over 100% in the next 30 years. So that's some additional pressure there. So I'd like to delve into a tiny bit more detail, once again, just to provide some insight as the potential information that students may have uh, available. Um, with regards to population uh, growth, for example, among the many findings that we discuss, population growth is projected to reach 10 billion by 2050. Um, by the same time, uh, the 40 least peaceful countries will have an additional 1.3 billion people and are going to be home to half of the world's population. 14 of the countries um, um, uh, will double their population by 2050. Um, the, this will make it the fastest growing region global, uh, globally. Um, and Niger is actually expected to uh, increase its population by 171%. This is a, a quick graph showing population growth depending on countries' level of peace. Um, so we see, for example, that whereas we see this uh, population growth that I've been talking about in very low peace countries, very high peace countries actually have a much lower growth. In fact, very high peace and very highly developed countries are expected to decrease in population by 2%. With regards to food security, um, we, the, we use a proxy here, we use a proxy of undernourishment because it's, it's near on impossible to um, find specific data on food insecurity because it's a very kind of sort of um, uh, umbrella term, if you will. So we use undernourishment, but using that as the basis, um, we estimate 2 billion people uh, currently face food security. 
and that by 2050, we expect that to increase to 3.5 billion. Now, over half of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa is food insecure. This is the highest of any region, um, and 65% of the population in each of the world's least peaceful countries and low-income countries experience food affordability problems. So to put that kind of sort of in a visual uh, graph, here we have it with Sub-Saharan Africa on the right-hand side, and we see the very luxurious position that North America and Europe currently occupies on this graph. You know, we hope that um, the Ecological Threat Register really provides students the opportunity to be able to kind of sort of uh, place themselves, their country and their experiences um, in, the, in, in what is kind of sort of a global measure and a global mindset. So I'd like to touch on natural disasters very quickly, also included in the report by the indicators that I mentioned. Um, uh, One billion people live in areas that combine um, uh, essentially um, a number of natural disasters each year with low or stagnant levels of, of positive peace, so a level, lower levels of resilience. Floods and, uh, floods and storms account for most of the natural disasters worldwide. In, in, uh, in fact, floods alone account for over 40%. Um, natural disasters displaced 25 million people in 2019. That's three times higher than the people displaced by armed conflict. And those are the projections that we use um, to, to arrive at our 1.2 billion people displaced by uh, 2050. And uh, just as, a, as an end note here, um, uh, a 2.1 two, uh, uh, 2 meter rise in sea levels is gonna permanently cover land that is currently home to 200 million people around the world. So with regards to resilience and positive peace, and this is in many ways actually where we hope students are, are going to be able to spend uh, most of the time, because what we want to do is we would like the Ecological Register to serve as a hook for students to explore other IEP products and other new gen products in a lot more detail, such as, for example, the Positive Peace Index and the Global Peace Index, which themselves contain a whole other variety of information and data related to peace and peace building. So this is kind of sort of a, a, a very a somewhat uh, basic uh, description of, of the nexus between ecological threats and resilience. On the left, you have low intensity and uh, catastrophic ecological threats. And in the center, you have resilience, which is essentially I'm breaking into two here. On one side, the, the coping capacity. And, and I, I'm sorry, this is, is not a great analogy, but the best one I've been able to think of now, it's essentially the ability of the, the skin to withstand the pressure from a knife. Um, and the second, you know, the second part of resilience is the ability to recover, right? The ability of the body to recover after a cut or the ability of a country to recover after an impact. Now, in the case of a low intensity shot, uh, at low intensity, you're more likely to be able to cope. Um, and even if there is a cut, um, uh, stretching the analogy, you're more likely to be able to, uh, to the, the wound is more likely to be able to heal. And it's very likely that you're going to return as a country will do to pre-shock levels of well-being, essentially using the same structures and societal norms that existed before. Now, in the case of catastrophic ecological threats, which are many of the ones that we're talking about today, um, coping capacity is easily surpassed, especially in the many countries that we've been discussing, for example. And that can and does lead to, a, or has to lead to a reconfiguration of all of the internal systems to be able to sort of deal with this new set of, of inputs that the system is receiving. Now, in many occasions, and for the most part, we see this actually being reflected in a dropping in a country's uh, level of positive peace, and then in its actual level of peacefulness over time. Um, so, so um, you know, there is the odd exception uh, to this as well, in which countries actually sort of take this as an opportunity to regenerate and, and, and a, certain, uh, a certain element of sort of rebirth, such as the case of, of Rwanda after the genocide, for example. Um, but for the most part, part they tend uh, uh, down. So I hope this kind of sort of makes the case for, for obviously students spending a lot of time on the resilience component. So I mentioned, um, you guys may remember the map that uh, we had here um, before related to the number of ecological threats. This is the map of actual um, uh, a vulnerability based on the number of ecological threats, but also the country's underlying positive peace uh, score. In fact, that is, that is the one previous, and this is the one um, taking into account the resilience. As you can see, you can distinctly see the three different belts here of the most vulnerable regions. 
So delving into a tiny bit more here, and I'm uh, nearly done. Mentioned briefly, there were 31 uh, ecological hotspots. These are the ones that combine the high number of ecological threats with the low levels of um, socioeconomic resilience, low levels of positive peace. And in these countries, nearly 750 million people live in areas with severe resource depletion already, war, water and food related. They live in areas with severe exposure to natural disasters. Um, and you know, with that and separate to that, 200 million uh, people could be displaced by armed conflict by 2050, taking into account uh, current levels of peacefulness alone. Um, so in essence, in essence um, there is a significant likelihood that this is gonna result in significant displacement over time. And with regards to what the immigration routes, well, obviously in South and Central America, a large amount of immigration is going to go to North America. And with regards to Af Africa and South Asia, a lot of that immigration is going to go to Europe. So additional food for thought there. Now, these are essentially the last two slides and probably not completely appropriate for the, um, for the presentation because it's all very small. But you know, this is just an example of some of the information that students can consult in the register, uh, providing with the, uh, the, the count of ecological threats on the left-hand side, the individual country name, and then comparing it to its levels of positive peace, how much positive peace has changed over time so that each and every student can do their own level of analysis depending on the country of interest, depending on the region of interest. And that is also uh, cross-referenceable, if you will, with uh, our other materials, the Positive Peace Index and the Global Peace Index. This is another one. This one relates specifically to natural uh, disaster hotspots. So I'd like to end essentially where I start, started, that the aim of the register is to, to act as a catalyzer for resilience building. Now, you know, looking at all of this sort of global uh, impact is definitely something that can be sort of very intimidating uh, and very scary. And that's sort of partially the, the point as well. Um, but it's also one of the reasons why we're so happy to partner with NewGen and, and um, Footprint because it really kind of sort of allows us to be able to explore much more concrete and personal ways um, that each of us, uh, yourselves us, uh, and your students can, can, um, can find to have an, an impact in what is uh, an individual impact in what is a truly global project, uh, pro, um, problem, excuse me. So with that in mind, I'd love to be able to hand it over to Dakota Stormer to tell us more about the Footprint app. Awesome, thanks Michael. Uh, very, very awesome presentation there. Um, and as you mentioned about uh, students being able to take on uh, and understand their individual impact, um, I really wanted to share a bit more about some tools that we have that can help students do just that. Um, similar to the Ecological Threat Register, identifying a bunch of challenges in society, there's one big challenge that we know, and that is climate change, right? And um, when you think about the individual impact that people have on climate change, it's a very large and growing problem that we see. Uh, so the average person emits around 17 tons of CO2 each year. Um, and when you think about the magnitude of that impact, that may not feel like a lot. Um, tech team, could you help me out and switch to the next slide, please? Perfect, thank you. Um, but when you think about the magnitude of that, you know, as an individual, it may not seem like a lot when you think about, you know, the multiple gigatons of CO2 that's emitted every year. But when you scale that up to the nearly 8 billion people on the planet and the over 5 billion people that are concerned about our climate future, that's a lot of billions of tons of carbon dioxide emitted uh, on an individual basis based off of our activities, our transportation, our food, our travel, our clothing, uh, energy sources, etc. Um, next slide, please. Um, and the big challenge that we see here is that over 70% of those people, of those you know, 5 billion people that are concerned about climate change globally, don't take regular action uh, in their day-to-day -day lives to understand, and, uh, understand their uh, individual impact and then take steps to reduce that individual impact. So there's that disconnect, right? And why is that? Well, there's a bunch of different reasons, a bunch of different pain points here. One is that it's difficult to measure, that's hard to experience, hard to really understand. Uh, it's inconvenient, kind of like a diet, and it's kind of confusing, right? So um, similar to uh, when you're trying to go on a diet, we've realized that sometimes it's good to have a little bit of help when you do that. Uh, next slide, please. 
And so that's why we've created the Footprint app. So the Footprint app is essentially like the MyFitnessPal for sustainability, where we help people calculate and track their carbon footprints and then take steps to reduce it over time to form more sustainable habits. Um, but what we, we do is we do it a little bit differently. So you can track and visualize your impact. We you know, show you how all of the different things that you do during uh, the day add up to make an impact. But then we also try to help you reduce that impact through uh, a competitive challenge. So in the classroom, what we do is we create this kind of gamified uh, challenge where over the course of 30 days, uh, students can compete with each other and also collectively work together to reduce the impact of the classroom and of their individual lives as well to form more sustainable habits. So there's, there's a statistic out there that says it takes maybe about 21 days to form a habit. Uh, so we do a 30-day challenge, which is incorporated into uh, subunit 5.11, ecological footprints, to help students be able to reduce their impact and then turn education into action. Um, so I'm hoping to see that uh, students can use this tool uh, to form those more sustainable habits and that all the students can utilize this in their lessons and be able to take uh, those uh, lifestyle habits that they've formed into the rest of their lives. Um, so here's a sneak peek of the lessons um, in unit uh, in subunit 5.11. That's where the footprint app will be utilized. Um, but as you can see, we've got a lot of other really great tools. Um, as Tucker had said, we've got um, activities, warm ups, we've got lesson plans where you have uh, PowerPoint presentations and the notes that you need, as well as uh, great homework activities and even a project that can go with that too. Um, but aside from those tools, uh, we also have some really great resources uh, in the form of case studies, which Patricia will be taking and sharing a bit more about. Oh, Patricia, you're on mute. <laughs> gotcha. I have noticed that along the way, a question that's come up is um, how do you define peace? And so you heard Michael mention positive peace building. And I think uh, before I talk about the case studies, I want to make this distinction. Um, so uh, in, the con in the context of new gen peace builders and a lot of the scholarly work that's going uh, on these days around peace education and peace building, the definition of peace has really morphed. So there was a time when peace was thought of as values for good living and a sense of humanity towards uh, one another. Um, sort of in the mid 20th century, uh, a gentleman came along named Dr. Johann Galtung, who introduced this notion of negative and positive peace. And in essence, what he said was, we are trained to think that peace is reducing violence. It's reducing the negative. It's making it not so bad. And he distinguished that from positive peace, which is active efforts, proactive efforts to create conditions of well being for all. Now, what the Institute for Economics and Peace has done when they talk about positive peace building is actually show uh, a framework, a set of eight pillars that you can use to think about are we actively doing things in communities and within institutional decisions and policy decisions that help us create conditions of well-being for all. And so I do want to note that um, those, uh, the eight pillars of peace framework and that explanation of peace from that perspective is part of the tools that we provide to you, or will provide to you. Now, um, I once, we once had a cohort where we asked uh, all of the university students in the cohort, how do you define peace? And a young woman from Vietnam said, I define peace as not having my sky be orange when I get up in the morning, not having to put on a mask to go through my day. And if I could, if we could get to a place where I could breathe freely, I would feel a sense of peace every day where I live. For me, that would be peace. So if you think about it, this conversation here is about how to think of positive peace and peace building, recognize conditions that are off kilter from that, and then go about using tools and creating projects and empowering young people to create new conditions of positive peace. So one of the things that we are including in all of these materials is eight case studies on what we call environmental peace building action teams. So students who have come together and using principles of design thinking and or a 10 step planning process designed peace projects. So one of the objectives that has been set in the United States is to reduce carbon emissions dramatically by half by the year 2030, as well as uh, uh, similar reductions in landfill and food waste. Um, in these eight case studies, uh, you'll see, and your students will have access, 
to, you will see how students saw a problem, learned of data, learned some information, saw an environmental problem, and went about uh, connecting with their community and designing a meaningful uh, peace project. Both of these examples I'm showing you here, uh, which happen to both be from North Carolina, where um, Tucker is from, coincidental, serendipity, um, are about carbon footprint reductions. Let me focus on the team on the left. The team on the left actually did a project called We Speak for the Trees. And what they realized was that, number one, they learned a lot about carbon emissions per person in the metropolitan region. Uh, number two, they realized that we have a disappearing tree canopy. And they came to understand the connection between replenishing the tree canopy and carbon emission reductions. Uh, along the way, they learned that there were certain parts of the city where uh, particularly low income neighborhoods where there were almost no trees and it had all kinds of social and cultural uh, impacts. And so they partnered with a nonprofit called Tree Charlotte that had always wanted to do an urban tree orchard. They'd always wanted to do it with young people. They had never found a route to doing that. So together they teamed up, they worked with the county health department, they worked with city officials, they found the neighborhoods that were very interested in having uh, these urban orchards, um, both to enhance the communities, but again, address this issue of the disappearing tree um, canopy. Um, it turned out that one of those neighborhoods was became very famous, unfortunately, in the United States for a series of racial incidents that occurred in the city that led to protests in the city of Charlotte. So they partnered with organizers in that community. They created the, the first uh, sample urban orchard it uh, caught the city's attention. Um, a local nonprofit dedicated to uh, health in the community ended up providing a $30,000 grant to Tree Charlotte to keep improving and increasing the number of urban orchards in the city. So what you'll find in these materials is examples of how students begin with a, well, why is that? to an actual project that can really have an impact. And so I love uh, Dakota's example of the 30-day challenge around carbon footprint, but also these case studies. So um, uh, I, one of the questions was, as we said, so what is peace? But now it's really time for questions and answers. So you've heard from Tucker, uh, you've heard an overview of the ecological threat register, um, you've uh, heard Dakota very succinctly introduce you to some of the tools that are available from Footprint Inc. And so we want to open to any questions. And we have moderators who uh, can help us out here uh, by starting with what we already have in the chat box or Q&A box. If it's all right, um, uh, Patricia, I'm just going to jump, just because I was typing the response as we speak, I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. uh, going to respond to the, the question, the, the follow-up question that Daniel had. Uh, his his question uh, specifically, or he mentioned to clarify, how does the ETR measure peace in its uh, studies? Um, so basically what I was in the process of, of typing is, the definition that we use in the Global Peace Index is the absence of violence or fear of violence. Um, so we, we track that, changes in that, um, using 23 indicators. Um, those are things related to, for example, uh, levels of incarceration, levels of homicide, uh, the number of active conflicts, the number of battle deaths, uh, the impact from terrorism, the availability of small arms, nuclear weapons capability, uh, investment in the military, for example. Um, but what we then do is we establish a quantitative measurement for that. And as I mentioned very briefly before, we then sort of compare that with a whole other variety of socioeconomic uh, data to try and arrive at a much more detailed and holistic definition of uh, peace, right? What is it, not only what are the most peaceful countries, but what is, what is it that makes them more peaceful quantitatively? So a large amount of work that we do revolves around the positive peace framework, the statistical analysis um, related to that. And uh, essentially um, the positive peace framework that we're referring to here uh, constitutes eight pillars. And we can generally say that for the most part, the most Peaceful societies on earth have a well-functioning government, they have equitable distribution of resources, there is a free flow of information, they have good relations with their neighbors, there are high levels of human capital, there's acceptance of the rights of others, there's low levels of corruption, and there's a sound business environment. All of these different factors um, interact with each other and affect each other, um, and, and are sort of this much more holistic definition of peace that we uh, that we uh, that we seek to learn more about. Is 
No other questions? All right, so I, I have one uh, that will help uh, for Tucker. So Tucker, you know, you are a, a new gen peace builder certified alumnus, all right? And, you know, you have now gone through this four month experience led by a master educator around developing this curriculum and integrating the ETR and integrating the footprint tools. You know, how do you think about the intersection of, based on all you've learned about the intersection of environmental science and uh, peace building? And I know you took a, an honors class, an honors uh, environmental science class. And so I'm, I'm curious, how do you think about the two? Yeah, it's a great question. I think over my time working on this project, I've really come to understand that there's also, there's often unintended social and political consequences that come out of um, negative environmental impacts. And then also a phrase that's always repeated to me that I'm reminded of from going through the program is think global, act local, which is something that I've applied to my own personal life with my peace project and my group's peace project. But it really challenges one to think about issues that threaten the entire world, such as environmental sustainability, but then see where you and your own personal community can have an impact. And I think that's something that this curriculum does well as far as challenging students to take initiative and see their own impact they can have. Yeah, thank you. You know, it occurs to me that um, uh, at the beginning of the webinar, we talked about, and Tucker, you did a great job of introducing what the five components of the materials are. And the first point you made was the materials start with three hours of professional development. And uh, as you said, you know, one can choose one of a number of sessions that will offer. Um, one of the things that really happens in the professional development is we'll take you through frameworks like the eight pillars of peace and definitions of peace and peace building and how you can use those tools and link them naturally for your students to what you have to teach about land and water use. And again, um, Tucker pointed out that of the 17 uh, subunits in the unit on land and water use in uh, advanced placement environmental standards, we have chosen nine. So we'll actually be able to walk you through um, the relationship between tools like the eight pillars of peace, um, how this relates to the uh, nine subunits that we've chosen, and we'll actually walk you through the content, all the lessons and activities where you will find reflection questions that you can offer to your students about peace and the intersection with that subunit. Um, and uh, it will give you sort of a, a, a a thought provoking and comfort and um, comfort level with this intersection between how we are defining peace and the tools we're using and how it intersects with uh, making a change in terms of sustainability. Um, Dakota, I'm wondering if you would like to add anything about that. Yes, uh, so of course, showing the link between um, environment and, and uh, peace will be the keystone part and utilizing that um, alongside the tools will be kind of the other part that will need some guidance. So, um, you know, part of that is showing you this is the ecological threat register, right, and showing you a bit more in detail about how that can be utilized. Um, but then another big piece is, you know, with using a new tool uh, that's tech related, there might be some challenges, right? Uh, thankfully, uh, the Footprint app is uh, was designed by high school students um, and made to be very user friendly uh, for uh, high school related competitions. So um, it's a fairly user friendly tool, but we will be guiding you through this is how you register, this is how you you get get the code that kind of thing that way you don't have to go through any tech challenges we want to just get that easy walkthrough type stuff for you too um, so that should be included there as well yeah great so a question that i see is um uh is it correct that you will have to complete the pd to have access to the materials a couple of things first of all the new ecological threat register is available publicly you could access that uh, on your own and so we really want you to know that as well as tools that uh, Michael has mentioned, like the Positive Peace Index or the Global Peace Index. Um, we really do want you to complete the three hours of professional development, uh, just because we think by completing that three hours uh, and really understanding this intersection between uh, these new definitions of peace and environmental science and actually seeing what's in this set of lessons and activities, um, it will you know, empower you or enable you as educators. Um, we are really hoping, we would like everybody to take a three-hour block 
uh, sometime in early October, and we'll put the dates on the screen at the end of the session, because we know at least for those of you who are teaching um, uh, advanced placement environmental science, that particular unit on land and water use probably comes up around the end of October. So why not have this as grounding beforehand? Um, of course, we want to emphasize that all the content that's in these materials and the PD does not have to be restricted to uh, the APES standards, to advanced placement environmental science, but we thought it was a perfect place to begin. And in the future, we'd really like to be adding more and more of these lessons to other units in the curriculum. Uh, another question that's come up is how we get involved with new gen peace builders. Um, separately, you can absolutely contact uh, Stephanie Suster, who is on the um, uh, informational materials we had sent out beforehand. But um, I'd like you to think about just by engaging students in the use of these materials, you're kind of on the new gen peace builders journey. Because again, the program is the intersection of the ecological threat register, the professional development, the tools from Footprint, the calculator, um, and the competitive challenge, and the app. Uh, and we have built it in a way that we would normally build this kind of learning for new gen peace builders. So you'd sort of be on the journey right away. Um, one thing I want to ask uh, Dakota about is I think there's also technical support that you'll provide to teachers when they go to use the app and or engage in the competitive challenge. Did you want to say something about that? Yeah, yep, exactly. Uh, so I know that, you know, there's often restrictions and challenges, again, like with using tech. And so, of course, we're going to teach you how to do everything that you need in the professional development, but we're not going to just leave you. Right? We're, we're here to support no matter what you need. Um, so my team, we have people that are very well equipped and trained in how to use all the tools. So if you run into any tech challenges at all, uh, we'll be happy to assist you. Um, we'll set up some times that are easily accessible so that, you know, we can do like a Q&A session and help people with commonly uh, address issues and you can also email us one off and we'll be able to help. Yeah, great. Um, now we've had an interesting question too about well, what happens if you're on a schedule where you're faster than the schedule I just laid out, the sort of um, PD in early October related to uh, content in late October. Um, what I would say is after this session, really, you know, we're, we're here, we're at your disposable, uh, disposal, <laughs> disposal, disposal. And so if there are special requests or questions like that, just reach out to us and we're going to try and accommodate you. All right, so um, we're getting to near the top of the hour. And of course, uh, other questions, you know, we certainly want to entertain them. Um, but we want to be sure to, again, put up those uh, dates for the professional development itself and uh, provide a reminder of how you can be in touch with us after tonight. We said our intention was to serve you with some new information, um, see if we could do our best to provide an ARC, uh, you know, a, a description of what materials are available to you, and then be available for you to join in the PD uh, and or engage with us otherwise around these new and developing materials. So um, there are options. We have three options right now for the professional development. You can see that two of them are on Saturdays, one's on a Wednesday. Uh, we have concluded that educators are simply busy, 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 and there's never the right time. And so, but we've done our best to think about three R blocks that might be suitable for you. Um, and we hope one of these at least will work for everybody who's with us tonight. Um, for questions, comments, special requests, and so on, Stephanie Suster, whose name you've seen before and who's been with us here tonight, though she wasn't a presenter, is a way to get in touch with us. And right there, you can see her um, email address as well as uh, call text. One other thing I want to say is we are recording this session tonight. And so we do plan to make the session uh, available and we can make it available to you. And we wanna make it available to other educators because there's many, uh, who might not have been able to be with us tonight, but are so excited about this program that we kind of have a, a list of, you know, please get me the recording so I can then do the PD and then go through this um, experience and use these materials. Um, so uh, panelists, is there anything else you would like to say in closing to our attendees tonight? No, from our, our respect, uh, just to just to kind of sort of mirror what you were saying, uh, uh, Patricia, to thank you uh, especially and Dakota for providing us the opportunity to to partner with you uh, on this, and and to all of the educators attending tonight. Uh, I mean, this is a, a distinct interest to IEP um, as a nonprofit trying to 
uh, raise awareness uh, and peace and peace building as well as the nexus um, between uh, climate change, ecological threats um, and peacefulness, this is, this is very much a priority for us. So we, we um, will not only participate in these professional development sessions as, as well, but would be very happy to have individual discussions with you with regards to how you could potentially use our research and um, even um, uh, you know, provide sort of additional uh, partnerships, um, presentations to students or interact with students in, in um, any way that you deem would be valuable. So very much open to discussion. Please feel free to contact us at any time. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Dakota Tucker? Yeah, uh, I don't have any more to add, um, but the big thing that I do want to say is um, just, wow. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very impressed by uh, the amount of uh, work that teachers have done, especially right now with the challenging environment to try to teach virtually in some places or teach in person or a mix of both. Um, and just wanted to say that like, you know, we are excited to be offering this to you um, without a cost right we we are here to be able to help support that and we're excited to um you know kind of work hand in hand with you as you go through this process um and we're just you know happy to have you here um and happy to see how we can work together to turn environmental education into action Tucker? yeah and i just want to take a chance to personally thank each and every one of you for being here tonight i truly hope you'll consider signing up we have a real chance to inspire new generation high school students it's my personal belief and I hope you'll take a chance. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for taking this time with us this evening and um, do do follow up and we will be sending oh, we will be sending out um, an email and materials to you in hopes that you'll want to join us in the PD and the use of the materials. Good night. <laughs>